All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jim Anderson. I'm with the Bloomberg Foundation. And before we kick off our panel, maybe just one huge round of applause for Michelle Jolin and her laser-like focus on helping governments at every level get better at using data and evidence to make decisions. You really are leading a national movement, and we're so proud to be a part of it. Uh, so I have been uh, with the Bloomberg Foundation for the past nine years. Uh, there we lead a global program, a cities innovation program focused on helping local leaders uh, connect with the resources, the tools, the knowledge they need to solve problems more effectively in their own communities. And economic mobility over the last couple of years has emerged as an area of huge concern, particularly to city leaders here in the United States. We were hearing from mayors in big cities and small cities in the heartland on the coast that they wanted to apply innovation, collaboration, data, and evidence to this particular challenge. So much so that we partnered with the Gates Foundation and the Balmer Group um, to launch uh, an economic mobility project with 10 US cities. That work is led by an incredibly talented team here at Results for America in close partnership with the Behavioral Insights team. And the goal of that project is to help 10 cities test interventions in the areas where the research and the evidence suggest the ground is most ripe for building opportunity in places that need it. Workforce, housing, education, financial security. We cast a wide net, we looked at cities all over the country and we identified nine cities where local leadership was particularly interested and invested in making a difference on economic mobility. Over the past number of months, we've been working closely with the teams in these cities to refine initiatives that we'll all launch uh, this coming fall. Very excited. And it is a real honor for me to be joined by three mayors that have really emerged as true leaders in the local fight to build opportunity in their communities. Uh, together, I think these mayors are going to help us all learn a lot about how we build opportunity in these places. Uh, I will quickly introduce the three of them. I'll start with some questions. Towards the end of this discussion, we'd like to turn to you. So if a question strikes you, please write it down. We'll make sure to save some time at the end of this conversation for you to ask. So immediately to my left is Latoya Cantrell, who uh, is the first woman ever to hold the mayorality in New Orleans. Her <clears throat> that is awesome. Um, her whole life has been steeped in community service. She once served as the secretary of local of her local Chamber of Commerce at the age of 13. <laughs> um, a well-known uh, neighborhood activist, uh, uh, an incredibly accomplished city councilwoman, the mayor has defined her first term in office by focusing on public safety, public health, boosting economic competitiveness, and small business creation in her city. To her left is Lovely Warren, also, the first ever mayor, female mayor of the city of Rochester. Um, mayor Warren has an also very distinguished career in public service. She's worked as a city councilwoman. She worked for the state assembly in New York. We don't hold that against her. They do do some great work. Um, and she has uh, made a real focus on job creation, fostering safe, more uh, vibrant neighborhoods and improving educational opportunities. I think the through line for Mayor Warren's work from an outside is the incredible effort she's put around galvanizing partners from academia, philanthropy, the private sector business to join the city and to extend its reach. And they are finally, uh, farthest to my left is G.T. Bynum, who is not the first male mayor of Tulsa. <laughs> <laughs> but he may be the most data and evidence-oriented mayor ever. <laughs> um, so he has held that seat since 2016, also served for a number of years in the state legislature on the city council, actually, um, GT was the first city council results for America local fellow, uh, which is how we first learned about him long before he was elected to the mayorality. Uh, he has made using data-driven outcomes to bring people together through his innovative programs and engaging residents a real hallmark of his mayorality. He's focused on public safety, community development, fiscal stewardship, and creating a more equitable city for all Tulsans. So please join me in welcoming these three distinguished mayors to our discussion today. <laughs> 
So, GT, you're about to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Uh, for those who are not familiar, this massacre took place in Tulsa's Greenwood neighborhood, uh, a formerly affluent African-American community that was then known as the Black Wall Street. Mayor, can you tell us about the legacy of this tragedy and how it connects to your work on economic mobility? Sure. You know, one of the really important things to put this in context for everyone is that this is... It was the, the worst city-based race massacre in American history, it happened in 1921, and then no one talked about it for 80 years. I mean, to the point where newspapers were removed from the library, it wasn't talked about in schools, wasn't talked about in public forums. Generations grew up in our city never even knowing it had happened. I mean, you hear about that happening in like authoritarian regimes. You can't imagine that actually happens in the United States, but it almost did. Uh, until a state commission started looking into it uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And that's when, 80 years after the fact, we started working on how do we address this and, and really uh, try to rebuild the city that was impacted by it. It was one night uh, a, a group of uh, a, a white mob went into the area, the predominantly African-American part of our city, this area was known as Black Wall Street, was one of the most vibrant African-American economies in the world, uh, and burned it to the ground that night. And so 80 years after the fact, we started talking about what we were going to do about this. Mm -hmm. And when my administration came in, what we recognized again, looking at data, is that kids that are growing up in this part of our city are expected to live 11 years less than kids growing up elsewhere in the city. It was one of the main reasons I ran for mayor. As a dad, more than anything, that resonated with me. I felt that we needed to be doing something about this. So when we came in, we really reoriented our economic development focus. This was an area of town you would think with Black Wall Street having been there that this would continue to be a focus for the city uh, on revitalization and said it wasn't. It was overlooked for generations. And so we put a focus on the economic revitalization of Black Wall Street and in North Tulsa in particular in the Greenwood area. Um, we landed the two largest new employers in the history of the city of Tulsa uh, in my first two years as mayor, and both of them we located uh, in North Tulsa. Um, we've worked with the George Kaiser Family Foundation, who you'll be hearing from later today, uh, to help revitalize a specific area, uh, to recruit employers to come into that area. Um, but the concern for me was that, as mayor, that we would be recruiting uh, all of these employers to come to town and all these new buildings would get built and that the folks who live in that area would just watch all this happen and wouldn't be involved in that economic revitalization. And it really hit home to me. Uh, one of the after effects of this is that, you know, you're talking about a, a lot of people who were murdered that night who died and they were buried and their families don't know where they are because nobody looked for them. For 98 years, the city never launched a search to find their graves. And, and so just in the last year, uh, my administration working with the city council launched that search. Hmm. And we were in a meeting with a group of uh, faith leaders talking about this process because when you start looking for missing graves from a massacre 98 years after it happened, there's, the technical side of it is the easy part. The, the hard part is the human relations side of it. Uh, and we knew that the city had not earned trust on this search. And so we're meeting with faith leaders, and a reverend said something to me that just crushed me. He said, you know, the goal of that mob that night was to run black owners out of Black Wall Street. And if you look at the last hundred years, they succeeded today uh, on Greenwood the only black property owner on Greenwood is a church, one church. And that made me so mad as the mayor uh, because suddenly that injustice is not something that happened 100 years ago. Suddenly that injustice is still going on, and it's something that we can be doing something about right now. And so what we've tried to focus on uh, is really a couple of big things. It's not just recruitment of companies to the area now, but it is also making sure that the folks that live in the area, and especially those kids who uh, are, are expected to live 
less just because of the part of town they're growing up in. We want them to have the skills to get the jobs of these companies that we're bringing in here. And so uh, we're working with an organization called Tulsa Community Work Advance to target uh, young Tulsans who aren't in between the ages of 18 and 24 who aren't in school and don't have jobs. We want to focus on them and help them develop the skills they need to get the jobs that we're bringing to this area. And then we're also focusing on entrepreneurship and, and we want that area, we want Black Wall Street to be Black Wall Street again and to have the property ownership in that area be focused in the African American community. So the, the work that we're doing, it is, you're right, Jim, it is driven by data, but it, it, this is about more than economic development for us. It, it is about social justice. Yes, mm -hmm. yes indeed. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly powerful, and um, one of the one of the elements of your work in Tulsa is taking an uh, evidence-based federal program, Work Advance, something that works, and applying it to a new population in a new context. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you're using not just the values that bring that work to the fore, but also data and evidence to evaluate and understand the impact? of that work. Absolutely. You know, I think one of the important things for us is utilizing that data, and so we've done it in a couple of ways. Uh, one big one is focusing on uh, just overall educational attainment and focus. We know uh, that in the next five to six years in Oklahoma, about three quarters of the jobs that'll be out there, you're going to need post high school education. And yet in Oklahoma, only about 20% of our workforce has that level of educational attainment. So we know that we need programs like this to give people the skills they need. And of course, we're pressing college, but college isn't the only solution to this. You have to have, I think, a multi-pronged solution. The other one is that, you know, I think a lot of the time in our country, we can try to think about one-size-fits-all solutions and apply one big thing that that we could do across the country that impacts everyone. What I love about the approach that we're taking uh, with Work Advance in Tulsa is that we're trying to tailor it to the specific issue at a more granular level that we have that we're trying to work on. You know, I, I was reading a, a biography like a month ago of Justice Brandeis, and he used to talk about the curse of bigness and how, especially in government, if you're trying to fix something or improve things on too large a scale, a lot of the time you can't move the ball forward. You can't make those improvements. But if you're working on a small scale, whether that's uh, from an economic standpoint or in our case, uh, a community development standpoint, the solutions become much more clear. And so uh, we know that we have uh, this population in our community that doesn't have the skills that they need to have uh, to, to have fulfilling uh, rewarding lives and be economically competitive moving forward and so we're focused in that way. The other thing that I would say we're focused on in this is looking at our population growth and one of the really interesting things we're doing in partnership with our, our public school district is, is looking at what are the fastest growing parts of our city and, and one of the big things we've noticed is the fastest growing parts of our city are also the most economically disadvantaged parts of our city. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be focused on uh, the types of uh, job training uh, and preparation that can help lift uh, you know, as Raj Shetty talks about in his work, lifting people out of one quartile uh, of income and, and going into the next. Great. Mayor Cantrell. Yes. So your economic mobility initiative is um, uh, incredibly exciting and focused on getting young people into high mobility career tracks and high quality internships. Obviously, an issue that I, I think mayors in many, many cities will be watching what you do here. Uh, how are you working to achieve this goal, and why is this your focus? Well, first of all, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, it's a focus because we understand and recognize that there is a tremendous uh, skills gap. Um, in terms of ensuring that we have, we're building, building the capacity so that our young people are prepared for the jobs that are coming and growing in the city of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So whether that is, you know, technology, you know, DXC was the largest, they based now in New Orleans, the largest in the state that we've received. They've made a commitment to uh, several thousand jobs. Uh, but what we see 
is that if we do not focus on growing that capacity and uh, closing that gap, then we will not be preparing the, 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 the residents of New Orleans, the young people of the city, to take advantage of those opportunities and therefore, you know, the company having to look outside of the city. And of course, that doesn't benefit, um, you know, the city of New Orleans, but more importantly, the families who are the backbone. And it really does start with focusing on our young people. Uh, we were able to, on the front end of this, uh, provide 100 uh, jobs uh, to 100 uh, system-involved youth age 14 to 21 this summer. And we recognize that we did not only employing them, but the wraparound services, transportation, you name it. 96% of those young people have, I mean, gotten on the right path. They have not uh, gotten into any trouble. They're staying in school. We're tracking and watching and monitoring them, doing a lot of hand-holding. But now, and thanks to the partnership uh, with you all, it is allowing us to, again, focus on those young people but now in an internship capacity, uh, wanting to connect them with employers in the city um, so that one, and what we recognize from the employers, they say, well, it's too cumbersome. Uh, you know, the paperwork that's required and you all wanna track these young people and do more handholding. We, we don't have time for that. So we said, well, you know what? Let us create a playbook. Let's give you the script. Let's work with you. I'm not just gonna unleash my young people to you. We're gonna work with you. And so this is, is our focus, this playbook. Uh, we're starting with a pilot of 50 out of those 100. Uh, we're looking to uh, attach them with mentors and employers uh, this, this year and begin to uh, manage and maintain that da data, monitor it at the start of 2020. So this is um, kind of hands-on. Um, as mayor, I created the first office of youth and families. Again, breaking down the silos, not only within government, but making sure that, hey, that we are making those connections with your public school system, with workforce development opportunities, with behavioral health uh, organizations, you know, with housing, just make that holistic approach that it will take to move people um, towards employment and being able to build wealth and transferable wealth uh, in our community. And, you know, I had the opportunity to uh, push forward a disparity study in the city of New Orleans and data. I mean, the data showed us that although uh, the businesses and small businesses in the city uh, make up 52% of them are minority owned, but when we looked at the receipts, they only make up 2% of the receipts. So we have to be more intentional in utilizing the data to meet our people. So I've developed another initiative, 2 to 20. Um, you know, so that means moving that 2% to 20% by 2020. And so we'll talk more about that as we move forward. Love but it. we have to be <clears throat> intentional here. That's awesome. I... <clears throat> the thing that really, I think, popped to us in this work in New Orleans um, so, you know, partly the hand-holding and the support for onboarding the young people into the internships, I think, is really cutting edge, really important, and cities everywhere can learn from it. But this focus on the businesses and business readiness and asserting a different role for local government to help prepare them to support these young people as they are. Absolutely. Is really important. How have businesses responded to that in some ways? Um, call for them to be more than they've been? Well, businesses are responding to, to us, meaning government, being more intentional and putting some skin in the game. Yeah. I think in a greater capacity than they've seen in the past. Whether it's the you know, five million that we created for a mobilization fund, working with those small businesses, giving them again you know, the, the hand-holding services that are needed to get them you know, ready to bid on contracts and the like. Just this week, um, for the first time in our history in New Orleans, I took you know, uh, from 15,000 to five million, broke, broke up larger scale projects that are multi-million dollar projects. And I created 15,000 to five million to where only uh, no, those small businesses that normally are the subs on jobs. Mm. And I removed that. I said, oh no, from 15,000 to five million, you can bid as a prime. 
So yes, we have a, you know, a, a DBE a goal of 35%, but I said, well, the hell with a 35%. We need to make sure that they're primes you know, on these jobs. And it's, it's contracts for five million, you know, contracts for, for 15,000. So again, meeting the people where they are so they can take real, you know, a, 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 a real have a stake in this opportunity and take advantage of it. Yeah. Build wealth, create those jobs because they're the first ones that are going to um, provide that opportunity, not just to our interns, but even to those who are re-entering society. Awesome, thank you. Um, Mayor Warren. Uh, so, Mayor Warren and also Mayor Cantrell happen to be um, participants in the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, and I, I have this memory of you in the classroom. Mayor Warren is an awesome student in the classroom. Uh, <laughs> she's that one that always has her hands up. Um, but I remember this one moment where you, you just spoke incredibly personally and powerfully about your focus on education, on helping residents in Rochester, earn more and save more. Can you talk a little bit about where that passion and that focus comes from? Okay, well, thank you, Jim, and thank you for being here today. I just want to recognize my uh, colleagues here for having the courage to do the work that they need to do. Uh, mayors are the people on the ground. Um, you know, in that meeting that you're talking about, I talked a little bit about my background and the fact that my grandparents came from King Street, South Carolina, and they were sharecroppers. And my father came to this country as an illegal immigrant from Trinidad and Tobago. And they came here because they wanted a better opportunity for the next generation. They wanted their children's children to be able to live the quote unquote American dream. And what I saw happening in our city was that we had a whole segment of our community that was being left behind. My family chose Rochester to not only raise their family in, but to raise the next generation in. And when I looked around and I saw that part of our community was moving forward, but there was another part that was stuck, that, were, that um, when big companies left, they were just stagnant. And what I commend uh, What Work City's uh, economic mobility for doing is because they're, they're taking those best practices across the country and they're sharing them. Um, what Mike Bloomberg was able to do is say, what worked in New York City, how do I replicate that throughout the communities? So I created an Office of Community Wealth Building. And the Office of Community Wealth Building is really trying to get and help people in our community learn how to make their money work for them. And so that's through the financial financial empowerment centers, but also when we file tax returns, a lot of our residents take um, or get a child income tax credit. And um, that raises their income, but they also get a significant amount of money um, from their tax returns. Um, you know, sometimes it's an upwards of $10,000 that they get in a lump sum. Well, if you haven't been trained or you don't know how to make that money work for you or to save that money over a period of time, usually people, we've seen them go out and buy new furniture they go out and buy a new car they don't make that investment where that you know in a house or save it for a house or save it for children's um, education and so what we're trying to do in Rochester is allow people the opportunity to recognize that they're a part of the solution and teach them how to actually make those dollars that they're getting in save them over a period of time so when a crisis hits I've seen a number of our residents where they may, uh, a car breaks down and now they're going out to get a payday loan and they're getting in further debt. Um, well, we allow those dollars that they actually receive, spread it over a period of time, give it to them in, a, in, you know, in increments, quarterly increment, increments, but we're also providing matching funds to see if that can change the crises that happen that actually send them back into the system of them actually being back on social services. We have a lot of people in our community that we consider to be working poor. And so it's not that they're not working, it's just that they're working poor. Their income and the decisions that they have made do not necessarily help them actually excel. Awesome, so the, I, I think you may, I, I'm, I'm not sure, you might know this better than I, but I, I think you may have established the first ever city office of uh, wealth building in the country, is that? 
Is that right? One no, of the I, first I won't for take sure. the credit. It comes <clears throat> from um, uh, Virginia, actually. Um, they do a li they do it a little bit different in in Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, but ours is the first of this kind, which really just focuses on financial empowerment. And and how do you situate that office in your city hall? How does it inform the work of your agency heads and so on and so forth? How does that work? It, it's directly in the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. And so the executive director who's here um, reports directly to me, Lomax Campbell, but it also informs us of how we are actually going to help our residents and where we make investments, right? And so when we talk about data, as the other mayors have spoken about, we looked at our challenged communities. Where do we have the most working poor? Where do we have the people that rent the most? Where are, when we're looking at, where do we make our um, infrastructure improvements, our roads, where are we demolishing houses, where are we uh, you know, planting trees and all of that? We're trying to change how people feel about themselves, especially in our most challenged neighborhoods. And if we're drawing from um, and, and utilizing the data that the Office of Community Wealth Building is, is providing, where these are our, where our residents live, and it's, uh, we have the highest concentration of poverty in the country in, um, in, in a certain segment of Rochester. And so we're utilizing that data to actually make investments of infrastructure, but also in telling us how to help those residents actually get the knowledge that they need to move out of poverty. And we're creating this stairway of, po of poverty as Mayor Cantrell said earlier, it's about meeting people where they're at. What is it that you need and how do we help you be successful? But we have to create the stairway. They have to want to walk it. That's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So <clears throat> in a few minutes, I'll take a couple questions from anybody in the audience that has one. Um, but let me ask a couple more to the three of you. So some suggest that there are sort of two paths to increasing economic mobility. One focused on moving people to opportunity, the other focused on building opportunity where people are. Uh, I'm not sure that there's such a huge divide, uh, but how do you think about this from the perch of, mayor, of being mayor? So for me, I think that um, when, you want, when you meet people where they're at, we assume that people know better. And I don't think that that is always the case. If you've only been taught a certain way, then you do things the way that you know how to do them. And you continue to do it that way until someone shows you it may be easier for you to do it this way. And it's the same thing that for cities. We continue to do things over and over again, and we expect a different result until somebody comes along or we you know, have the data and to, that tells us that you need to do this differently. So with, with moving snow um, in our city, we, we created this system called Plow Treks, and where we actually allow residents to go on and uh, go online and, and see where the snow is being removed from and where their plow is in their neighborhood so that they don't go outside and plow their driveway and then we come along with the street plow and, and, and fill it back in and they they're frustrated they're they're upset with us and I get calls to the mayor's office like I just plowed my driveway um, so we created the system but but part of meeting people where they're at is to understand that there may be a better way and providing that information to them and not necessarily assuming that they know better and for many many years we have um, looked at economic nobility and poverty as that everyone needs to fit into this circle. And sometimes people are a square, sometimes they're a triangle, sometimes they're a rectangle. And we have to change. We had to change in order to meet the needs of our people. And we cannot build systems that only fit one particular mold because it won't work. And I think that that is the best thing that we as cities can do because we're the people on the ground and we see the people in our churches, we see them in the grocery store, we see them in the schools. And so we know what they're going through and for us not to meet them where they're at would be a travesty. And I think I commend everyone, you know, my colleagues and everyone that's a part of this because we're changing the dynamic by making sure that we account for the fact that everyone isn't the same and we have to develop programs in order to fit the lifestyles of the people that are in our communities. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And, and, you know, as a mayor, you, you have to have the courage to just bust the system up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and 
I was faced with this, um, really this, this year, the end of, of last to this, and it was, around, it was around infrastructure. And the state of Louisiana receives the majority of the revenue generated off of hospitality. New Orleans is a world-class city, hospitality focused, the engine, you know, that drives the state. But the city of New Orleans would get less than nine cents on the dollar. Um, and we would see 18 million visitors just in, a, in the past year, which is an added burden, you know, on your infrastructure. We have 405,000. And if you do the math, it's like um, 40 visitors per one resident. And I said, well, just imagine, they're flushing your toilets, you know, using all your, it, it matters. And so I had to lead the charge at the state level and was told, oh, no way. It'll never happen. New Orleans we get, would not get a, another dime from the <coughs> taxes generated. Well, pushing that status quo, working the relationships around the state, because we are red state and, you know, you have to do that. And um, it was perceived that this could never happen. Well, you know what? State legislature ended this, this uh, spring giving the city of New Orleans a little bit more of what she generates up front of $50 million, a uh, recurring $27 million for infrastructure. Wow. This has, had never been done, said it could never happen, but it built momentum and it showed our people that we can fight for what we know we need, but what we also create. Mm -hmm. So that was just getting our foot in the door but absolutely the city of New Orleans stands to receive more. And you also have to think about the people who are the backbone of that industry, mm -hmm. who are not paid a living wage. Right. You know, so um, that's, we have to push. We have to get outside of the comfort zone. And when we do that, understand that absolutely you can bring people with you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think it's such an interesting question, uh, you know, the notion of do you bring opportunity to people or do you expect them to go to it? Uh, but I would say that, again, comes back to really the, the moment I decided to run for mayor. Uh, when I was sitting in uh, my home on a Sunday morning reading our, the Tulsa World newspaper and there was a, an edit, a, a guest op-ed in there by uh, a, a local public health leader talking about how kids in our community in, in one part of our city are expected to live 11 years less than kids in other parts of the city. I'm sitting there drinking coffee in my home and my, you know, at the time, six-year-old and nine-year-old are there and I thought, you know, for me and my wife, they're the most important people in the whole world, those two kids. And I know that my neighbors who live in this other part of the city love their kids as much as I love mine and yet their kids are expected to live 11 years less than mine, the city needs to be doing something about that. Uh, those kids should not be robbed of a decade of their life just because of where they happen to grow up. And so that's why we established as a goal for us that Tulsa is a city where every kid has an equal shot at a great life. That's our goal. Um, and to do that, we partnered with the City University of New York to create what we call the equality indicators. Again, always want to go back to the data, not using gut feel or anecdotes, but really utilize demographic data uh, that's collected independently in the community to tell us, and, and City University of New York takes this and they translate it in a report that we've now issued two years in a row. We'll issue it every year. And the equality indicators, they measure the, the level of equality in Tulsa across a broad range of spectrums. Yes, uh, issues of, of race. Uh, we've had a lot of debates in our city over the last two years around, in particular, like police use of force based on race. Uh, uh, there are issues around age, around veteran status, uh, around, uh, you know, e especially around economic development. What parts of the city have more banks, the ratio of banks to payday loan centers? What parts of the city is that skewed and where is that unequal? And so we try to utilize that data and, and that allows us then to try out different strategies each year to draw more equality in our city across this broad range of spectrums uh, and, and to see which factors are working and which aren't. And, and I think that's, if, if I leave everyone here with nothing else today, the most important thing I can convey is that the use of data is not 
a value in and of itself. For us, data is a tool that allows you to take things out of the realm of philosophical debate and partisan division and instead just boil it down to practical problem solving. And, and that's, again, what I love. Thank you to, oh, that's a guy from Tulsa that started the, uh, the applause. Okay. It's Michelle Jolman. <laughs> Home crowd, all right. Thank you. Uh, no, but um, I, I, that's what I love about the work that Raj Shetty is doing and why we're so excited to be involved in it. Because I think, again, when you talk about at the federal level, things can seem so big and so they become, it's impossible to solve and so we're just going to debate it and try and blame one party or the other for why it's not being fixed. Well, what, we're, what you're seeing in cities around the country right now is that that's being boiled down to a local level mm -hmm. where as mayors, we don't have the luxury of debating stuff and having philosophical debates. We have to fix things. Right. Mm -hmm. And now what's being done is it's being boiled down from a citywide level to a neighborhood by neighborhood. Mm -hmm. What neighborhoods have those characteristics that enable greater economic mobility than others and how can we learn from that and then apply that to neighborhoods across our city? So I'm, I'm very excited to be involved in that work. Awesome. So uh, one of the things that RFA does, I think, better than anybody is um, by, you know, it has a great, the ears of many people within federal government, um, in Congress, think tanks here in Washington, D.C. I think many people in this room um, uh, come from those different worlds. Um, if you, you know, they're writing policy, they're advocating for policy changes. If you could wave a wand and see one policy change at the federal level that would help you in this work to address economic mobility, what would you put forward to this audience? Hmm, that wand, boy, I tell you. <laughs> so Pix, get one some thing. pixie dust, too. <laughs> well, I would start with, um, I would say infrastructure. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, infrastructure is, is, of course, your, you know, streets, roads, drainage, that sort of thing, but it's also transportation. It's housing, and all those are key components. And we've seen in our country, our cities have just not been invested in as it relates to infrastructure. The needs are great, the environment is shifting, climate change is real, hello, <laughs> uh, and, and we need help. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I couldn't disagree. I think mm -hmm. that um, Mayor Control is right. When you invest in infrastructure, you're investing in jobs. Yep. And um, when you're putting people to work, they're able to take care of their families. And I think that um, more dollars invested in infrastructure across the board would help cities tremendously um, because you know we can't tax our way in t out of the issues that we have. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about roads, when we're talking about housing, when we're talking about um, the things that we need to do um, as it pertains to employment, uh, the way to take care and to have uh, to help a child, the best way to do that is to make sure that their parents <coughs> have access to a quality job to be able to take care of them. And I think that that's the way that the federal government could help us a lot. Thank you. I, I completely agree on infrastructure, but I would say, you know, I noticed earlier when Michelle was talking, he had the Results for America All-Stars up there, and Mitch Daniels' picture was on there, who's one of my heroes, and when he led the Office of Management and Budget, they had a, a program called the PART Tool, and the idea of that was that federal programs had to be able to demonstrate results to get funding, mm -hmm. and that if you couldn't, then funding would be taken away, and uh, shocking conclusion there that over time the elected officials decided they didn't want to have the part tool around and did away with it. Um, I would say to bring that back. I think one of the, we try to do that at the city level. Uh, we, again, we don't have the luxury of spending money that doesn't demonstrate results. Uh, and so we're constantly evaluating programs that we have. And, and if something isn't demonstrating results, then you need to try a different strategy out. It's not about being punitive. It's about being creative. It empowers you to be creative and identify which strategies work. Um, and one of the greatest tragedies I can think of is to be spending billions of dollars on something that has no demonstrable result for the people you're trying to serve. I mean, that's the purpose of spending the money, isn't it? It's not so that the elected officials can 
pat ourselves on the back for spending money on something. It should be about serving the people that we're elected by. So I would say bring back the part tool uh, and force federal policymakers uh, to be able to demonstrate results of the money they're spending. And if it's not, then shift to a different strategy that can. That's great. And that's the power of this room, too. That's the power. On that <clears throat> leveraging the, the, the public-private partnerships, mm -hmm. having the private investment on the front where you can do the work, you can do the pilot, you can prove that it works. And then show your people through data, when you can't, if you don't measure it, you know, it's, it's hard to, to manage it, but you can show them results and therefore justify the need to go ahead and put a little skin in the game That's right. with public well, money. Mm -hmm. Awesome, so let's uh, thank you for those answers. Uh, why don't we take a couple of questions from the audience? Can I see some hands? Highly held. <clears throat> Any questions out there? Please, not all at once. <laughs> right over here. Over, uh, we're going to bring a microphone to you so that everybody else can hear. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Mayor Control. Hey, um, you mentioned the high quality internship program, so um, I really appreciate the story. Um, so speaking of the work-based learning program, um, it can help students to be ready for a career in college. So, but uh, United States has less students uh, entering into work-based learning program compared to uh, students from other countries, for example, Japan. So I was curious to know if you could tell us more about uh, how do you use data to um, track and work on the supply side of the work-based learning program and also the demand side of it? And how do you make sure the equilibrium between the two? Well, one, it's, it's really, it's, it's matching. It's matching the, the, the student uh, with that sector. And so, and, and also understanding and leveraging your resources is that those pipelines are not necessarily going to college. And it's also activating those workforce investment dollars that you leverage as well. So it's about, it's, it's that, it's, it's pretty much matching, kind of like speed dating. <laughs> but, but what it does, it speaks to our need to know our people. You have to know who you're serving. And you cannot do that without data and understanding, again, meeting people where they are. Not everyone is in the same situation. Not everyone has experienced trauma the same way or multiple you know, phases of trauma, but it allows you to dig deeper in what those needs are as well as what the sector, what the job, what the supplier is looking for um, and make that match and do what it takes, that hand help holding that's necessary to make sure that you're putting that individual on the right path to success. It's not, it's not difficult. You have to know people. And in this society, sometimes we kind of go so further apart instead of coming together with all this social media. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our work, hey, you have, to, you have to get on the ground. You have to walk those neighborhoods. You have to touch those people. Mm -hmm. You have to and know those families. Mm -hmm. And then work also connecting that family, the holistic you know, approach to services. And uh, in my city, that's exactly what it takes. Because when I have 63% of my folks living in poverty, you know, or I have, you know, uh, over 50% of my people, really close to 60% of my folks are renters, mm -hmm. you know, and then those 2% making up the receipts, you know, there are needs there. And also uh, sectors that are growing, technology, digital media platforms, advanced manufacturing. I need to build those skills up so that our people can take advantage of those jobs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Any other questions out there? Right up here in the front, please. And then we'll go to the table sort of midway back. Hi, I'm Carrie Chihawk from King County. And I'm interested in hearing you talk about not only how you, you know, you've talked a lot about already how you use data within your government, but can you talk a little bit about how you've put data in the hands of the community and what, what's resulted from, from that? 
so for, for Rochester, we have a partnership and we've been able to partner with our university. We, we're surrounded by 19 colleges and universities. We also have a lot of not-for-profits in our community. And so how we've looked at it is why is it that we have all of these different not-for-profit programs? And if you have a problem in our city, we have a program that has been meant to fix it for 20 years, right? <laughs> and uh, we also have this great infrastructure, meaning our colleges and our universities that's there. And there has been disconnect in, in sectors. So university not connected to city or county or to not-for-profit. And so we've all come together and sat, sat and we were sitting at the table talking about how health disparities impact what's happening in our hospitals and what's happening in our neighborhoods and how what's happening in the environment, how what's happening in our schools um, impact what happens in the neighborhoods, what happens in the hospitals, what happens in you know the, the economic uh, development workforce um, spe spectrum. And so one of the things that has been very, very important for us is to utilize the data to cross, connect, and pollinate. Mm -hmm. And when you're able to do that, you're able to see that we're all serving the <coughs> same population in a different way, but we're not talking to each other. And so as has been indicated by Mayor Cantrell, that data and knowing who you're trying to serve and what's the best way for you to serve them, we're all serving, we're all using, utilizing the dollars that we have in our wheelhouse, we're just not using it in the most effective way. And that's how we've been able to utilize the data externally outside of City Hall to connect the dots for our residents so that what's happening with them as it pertains to their diabetes or their health is being monitored and checked and we're looking at what's going on in the environment in the neighborhood, where do they live? Why is, is, is that causing their asthma attack or is it something else? Is it lead poisoning that's causing our children to act out in school? What do we need to do and how do we change that? And we, you know, in, in Rochester, the data, when it comes down to lead poisoning in children, um, this year we've had the lowest number in over a decade and we continue to reduce lead poisoning in children because of that focus and utilizing those health disparities to actually tell us what's happening with children in classrooms and what we need to do as a city. Hmm. Um, in Tulsa, you know, at the outset, when I came in, we really tried to be very transparent on the data that we had, so we created a lot of portals uh, you know, we put the equality indicators out there. We partnered with Gallup to do uh, what we call the City Voice Index. It really uh, does a deep dive on how people feel if they're thriving or not in Tulsa and looks at a, a broad range of factors on that. We've put that out there. But what we found was, you know, that it's only at value if it's actionable. And so uh, my first year as mayor, we created a program called the Urban Data Pioneers. Um, it's kind of a corny name, but we felt that <laughs> if we called it the, you know, City Data Analysis Club, like no one would show up. <laughs> so we called it the Urban Data Pioneers. And the idea was that we would take this data, because we realized when I came in, like there were so many things we wanted to apply data to and, and uh, analyze it and develop solutions, and we just financially couldn't hire enough data analysts to do all that work at the city. And yet we felt like there were a lot of people in the community who know how to analyze data and don't necessarily get hit up a lot for, to utilize that skill. So we put it out there, just advertised on social media, and in our first year we had over 100 people participate. What we found was you have the, we had a lot of people in our community who worked in banks and, and in hospitals and in energy companies who have this very unique skill and yet when people want to fix a problem they always think to go to the government or to the foundations and they don't think to hit up the data analysts. Mm -hmm. And so they have this skill, they want to help our community and so we gave them a vehicle to do that. We said, Here's all this data, help us solve these problems. And I'll give you one very concrete example of what they did. And, and we broke it up into cohorts. So they can, we put out, you know, usually 10 to 12 different problems. They can pick which ones they work on. They work independently and then they bring us the solutions back. One really tangible uh, win that we've had just in the first year of it, and we've been doing it for two years now, uh, is they analyze our 911 call data 
and, and compare that to the staffing levels that we had in 911. Because obviously, you know, in Tulsa, and I think in any of our cities, the majority of what we spend in our budget is on public safety. And the way most people access the public safety apparatus they're paying for is by calling 911. Every second that they have to wait to get through to someone is, uh, can be an endangerment for their lively, livelihood. So uh, our urban data pioneers compared staffing data to uh, the call volume and found that we needed to shift our staffing to be at peak call time. We've done that and that's helped us improve our response time for those 911 calls. Again, this is a group of volunteers uh, in the community that took the data that we made available to them that we were collecting anyway, but we empowered them to utilize it to improve our city and our service delivery. Awesome. Can quick I thing go? to add, sure. I know, yeah. I know time is going. Go quick. <laughs> well, what I would just kind of throw out there, um, it's very fascinating. One, you, you connect the dots, you break down the silos in New Orleans. So making sure the data is accessible, whether it's at our libraries, you know, at our recreation centers, of course at City Hall, but breaking down again that. So it is outfacing. But one of the things we recognized that we were pushing, you know, the information out but there were walls to where information couldn't flow to us. Mm -hmm. So we opened that up. Like, I want to hear from you. I want to. And so when now, and a part of this too is building trust. Because you can have the data out there, but if they don't trust you, they say, yeah, right. You know? mm -hmm. And so um, with opening it up with the two-way communication, it's actually helped us build trust because they can speak to us in real time, give me you know, whatever issue they have. We get it. We respond. But then we also respond on the ground which builds trust. So then they begin to trust the information that you're actually sharing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a work in progress, but it's, again, meeting people where they are, letting them know that they matter, and that when they reach out to you that you're actually listening, and, um, and that we're not afraid of it. Like, you can tell me, you can rip me a new one. It's okay, <laughs> you know, so, but I'm open to that. Yeah. But also <laughs> understanding that the information just cannot be top down, it has to be bottom up. Awesome. We are out of time. Uh, are you all feeling inspired by America's local leaders? I sure am. Please join me in thanking them for being with us today. Thank you.